morning, and my name is Mario Fazio. I'm a partner with Myers Roman, and we were at the business succession planning uh, breakfast briefing this morning. So, if you didn't intend to be here, you probably need to be somewhere else. Uh, but, you know, the business succession planning has been a topic that we talk a lot about with clients, particularly clients that are approaching retirement age. Uh, it's something that they need to think about. Um, you know, there's issues about untime, unexpected death or disability, um, which really cause a need to do succession planning and think about how control would be shifted to someone else to run the business so that the business doesn't suffer a diminution in value due to such a dis disruption. Um, so it's something that we talk with, about, with clients about um, and try to plan for that uh, occurrence. Um, it's something that we see is critical to uh, the family, the, the business owner, the uh, spouse, and kids, particularly if they're involved in the business. And, um, you know, in, in Northeast Ohio and throughout the United States, family-owned businesses are a really important part of our economy. Uh, half the jobs or over half the jobs are provided by small family businesses. It's responsible for a tremendous amount of uh, gross domestic product and it's a engine of growth and of new job opportunities. So not only is it important to their, our clients, but it's important to the economy as a whole. Uh, today we're going to present uh, different aspects of business succession planning. Uh, my esteemed colleagues here will be pr uh, providing different uh, topics. Uh, Jason Boneyard is with Apple Grove Partners. He will be presenting a uh, a discussion on appraisal, you know, different methodologies for appraisal. Um, the, the value of the business becomes central to the succession planning, so it's important really to start with an appraisal. Um, and then we'll lead into John Harubin's discussion on exit planning st strategy, and in particular, how to prepare a business for sale. John is uh, Executive Vice President with um, Edgepoint Capital Advisors, and uh, involved with many engagements uh, with companies that uh, are looking to sell their business and planning for that exit and getting ready for that the sale transactions. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jason to lead a discussion on appraisals. Thanks, Mario. Good morning, everybody. Um, Quick show of hands, how many of you in the audience have been uh, part of an appraisal process, whether it's your business has been valued as a, or as an advisor, you've helped with uh, preparing a report or um, advising a client through that business valuation process? Good, so a couple people have been exposed. I'll try uh, you know, to go over the methodologies fairly quickly and get into more of the, the planning aspects that could be uh, taken advantage of in a succession planning uh, context. Business valuation for succession planning. Thank you, Mario. Yeah, that would be helpful. Uh, so I, I can't start this without first having a shameless plug for Apple Growth Partners. Um, we are a, a regional accounting firm primarily. We focus primarily in tax and audit. Two offices, one in Cleveland, one in Akron. I head up our business valuation and litigation support department. We have seven full-time folks. That's all we do is appraisal of privately held companies for all kinds of different purposes. Um, so my presentation today is going to focus on sort of the theoretical valuation world as opposed to um, where John and Mario might get into more of the uh, transactional uh, M&A uh, based uh, valuations. Uh, and as we all know, if, you, if you're familiar with appraisal, such as real estate appraisals, um, the value that can be derived under a theoretical valuation conclusion could be very different than what an actual transaction occurs at. And we can discuss some of the reasons why that, that there's a difference there. Um, Apple Growth provides valuation services for a range of different types of needs, including fair market value opinions for transactions, for ESOP opinions as well. Uh, estate and gift tax valuations, which I think will be something we highlight here today as a very useful succession planning 
uh, tool. Um, we also provide litigation support, whether it be lost profits, economic damages, shareholder disputes, um, and some transaction due diligence. All right, so for those of you that are familiar with valuation, know that there are really three approaches to valuing any privately held company. Um, the cost approach, the income approach, the market approach. Uh, the cost approach, much like it sounds, is basically looking at what the assets of the um, company are worth, and those are the fair market value of the assets, less its liabilities. What you have left over is typically um, the lowest value of the equity, we call that a floor value, because it doesn't typically address intangibles. Uh, which oftentimes, hopefully, that's one of the largest assets of a business. Um, the income approach, like it sounds, uh, it looks at what's the income generating ability of the company and, um, and deriving a value based on that, based on the risk of the company. And then the market approach, much like it sounds, is looking to the market for transaction multiples to apply to a company in order to derive a value. Um, and so in the theoretical valuation world, we have these three approaches. And what we're attempting to do is recreate <laughs> what a hypothetical willing buyer and willing seller would pay for a privately held company. And that is, um, you know, it, it typically is a lower value than what a strategic buyer who's going to bring their own synergies to the table. So doing a valuation process or planning around a valuation process if the idea of thought is to save estate taxes if the idea of thought is to transfer the business to a friendly party whether it be a family member or business uh, management team member um, that might be one of the better routes to go just because you are going to achieve a goal at a lower value um, within the cost approach really where we look where you'll find most valuation reports um, if they cross your desk um, presenting a value is uh, really the starting with the book value of the company right what are the the accounting costs of the asset less the uh, carrying values of its liabilities for its net equity and then appraiser will make adjustments from that because as we know book value does not really measure the true value of a company or its assets due to depreciation and some other factors. Um, so the next challenge for, for, for us in the starting point is to figure out what the assets are really worth. Are the receivables really um, collectible? Do we need to take some sort of reserve against those? The inventory, is it slow moving? What, what is obsolete? And uh, these are, even if you intend to sell your business to a third party, for potentially a much higher value. It's always very important to, to know what your balance sheet is worth because lots of times there's gonna be working capital or other adjustments that go into um, ultimately negotiating a transaction price. So whether or not you wanna go to market or you wanna go through a valuation process, we almost always recommend going through a cost approach analysis so you understand what your true balance sheet is worth. The um, sort of on the next slide under the cost approach, um, one of the things I'll highlight here are the off balance sheet or contingent liabilities. And these are things, again, if you're going through a sales process or it's a valuation process, you want to spend time with your advisors, with your key management <laughs> team to really figure out what your exposure is for any off balance sheet liabilities. You know, a big one we always see that gets caught up in transactions are um, some environmental concerns. Uh, you might have um, pension uh, funding issues, and, and those are obviously things that a buyer or an appraiser like myself, uh, putting our shoes in the, in our, ourselves in the shoes of a hypothetical buyer, are going to want to consider. So um, that it's a useful exercise to go through that process. The, uh, the next approach is the income approach. And I would say this is the preferred methodology that business appraisers like to use. And I say that because um, it allows for probably the most amount of flexibility in understanding and projecting out what the future of a business looks like. And if you have a sophisticated business, 
that's doing good management planning and projections, this is a very viable method. Lots of times you don't have management that helps or has thought about um, creating a projection into the future so we can either help them or we look at some other methods. Um, I guess the, the tenant for those, the, those of you that aren't aware, um, in an income approach, and it really applies to all the approaches, is what an appraiser is looking to do is understand what's the true free cash flow of the business. What can an owner or potential buyer take out of the business without harming the operations? So it's typically adding back non-cash um, expenses. It's taking out the future expected investments and capital expenditures and your change in working capital. And those are the types of things that get you to free cash flow. And we take that free cash flow and whether we apply a multiple and a market approach or we divide it by a cap rate, if you ever hear that term, those are just measures of risk, uh, expected rates of return. So appraisers have lots and lots of um, tools to help determine what those rates of return should be. I won't bore you with any of those right now, but if you are interested and care to know, I'm happy to discuss them. The, uh, so as I said, if the, on the next slide under income approach, the capitalization of earnings, if you have a, a management team that does not prepare projections, you're really stuck at looking at historical averages. And we like to look at a long-term average that covers um, an entire business cycle, if it's possible. We have lots of cyclical businesses in Northeast Ohio. And so on, from a, an appraisal perspective, we certainly want to take into account the good years and the bad years. Uh, obviously, if you're a business owner and you're trying to sell your business and you're at the peak of the market, you probably don't want to go back five or six or seven years and certainly don't want to look at 09 or 08 in your average, uh, but don't be surprised if the evaluation analyst does do that. Uh, so the capitalization of earnings is basically it's a truncated discounted cash flow. You're looking at one single period and capitalizing that cash flow as opposed to looking out four or five years and bringing those cash flows back to present value. The next slide of Normalizing historical earnings. This is, uh, again, it's important whether you're taking your business to market, whether um, you're just valuing it for gift to uh, a next generation. These are all of the types of adjustments that a business appraiser is looking at to get to what is that true cash flow of the business. Um, the, probably the first adjustment most business appraisers make is looking at owner co or family compensation. Um, lots of times in a privately held company, family owned company, there are folks on the payroll that haven't been to work in years and they live in a different state. And so we certainly, if you wanna capture the true value of the company, those are the types of expenses you would be adding back uh, as a hypothetical seller or buyer. The, uh, the other list that sort of, um, falls into that category is owner perks. And uh, this can be a, a really long list. And depending on um, your client's sensitivity to IRS audit and things like that, these might be ones they don't come forward with. Um, but it's obviously in their best interest uh, if they're going to market to make sure you cover all these items. Uh, my, my favorite example of this is a manufacturing company I had. Um, this was in a litigation context, not an Apple growth client. I just want to say that. <laughs> and uh, this was their manufacturing company. The owner, however, liked this particular restaurant and purchased a restaurant and remodeled it several million dollars. And um, about a million dollars of it showed up in his cost of goods sold in his manufacturing uh, business. So that was certainly an ad bag. So I've seen everything, including literally the kitchen sink in that example. Uh, the other items you're going to want to adjust for in the historical earnings are uh, non-recurring expenses, things that don't, um, you, you don't plan to see recurring, um, severance packages, litigation expenses for unusual litigation, um, those types of things. Also need to investigate all re related party payments. And a good example of this is rent payments 
to a captive real estate holding company. That's something that always needs to be examined when determining fair market value and certainly understanding what the value is in the transaction. If the buyer and seller are going to come to terms on a lease rate, you should be putting that lease rate into your valuation model. The, uh, really, the, the last methodology is the, the market, market uh, approach. And here, basically, what we're looking at is um, two, two, data, two sources of information. Publicly traded companies, what multiples are they selling at? That's not our preferred methodology. It's for smaller privately held companies, it's, it's harder to make a good comparison between that company and a billion dollar multinational uh, diversified company, but it is one of the recommended methods by the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, the other method that's probably more prevalent for smaller mid-market companies is the uh, private transaction method. And there are a number of uh, databases that we have access to and business appraisers have access to um, that are basically created by business brokers. So business brokers report actual completed transactions for 100% controlling interest. We have access to that information. We can search it by size, SIC code, um, uh, keyword. There, it's, it's pretty uh, robust in the way you're able to search for these. So again, we're trying to find comparable transactions to determine what the market is pricing this industry at today. I'm going to skip over the, uh, the next couple slides in the interest of time. Um, and I'm going to go to the enterprise value slide. Um, and, and for those of you that are advising your clients on uh, purchases and sales of business, you probably understand this concept. But we often, when we're ad talking with business owners that have never gone through a sale process, never gone through a valuation process, this concept can be a little foreign to them. And that is enterprise value or market value of invested capital. And that, and that basically is looking at the total value of the company, and that being the market value of the equity and the balance sheet liabilities and really interest-bearing debt because um, a company that's funded with debt, the bank basically owns part of the company and that needs to be considered in the overall capital structure. Um, and so in a transaction, I think John will probably get into this a little bit, typically what you're looking at is a, um, if you're using a valuation approach or a transaction value, it's going to be cash-free, debt-free. You keep your cash and uh, you assume liabilities if, um, it's an, if it's an asset sale. The, uh, so the approaches, the approaches to value are a little bit different on the next slide for M&A or going to market. Uh, the theoretical formal valuation, nobody really cares. They, they kind of hope they blow that out of the water by creating an auction situation. So, um, and I don't get my feelings hurt by that. It's okay. Uh, but you know, you're going to go through this preliminary market valuation to try to determine what your bottom line might be. You're going to look for those strategic buyers and figure out what kind of synergies they might be able to bring to the table and hopefully price those in when evaluating what the company might be worth. And then, of course, the transaction values, ultimately, what did you end up um, agreeing to at the end of the day? The... Um, the next page has some standard definitions of value, and uh, I think the first one, fair market value, for those of you that, that are familiar, that is, um, that's defined by the Internal Revenue Service as a hypothetical willing buyer, willing seller, no compulsion to buy or sell. Both parties have all knowledge of relevant facts. So it's a hypothetical, really, financial buyer. And um, there's, a, so there's a really good case law in the United States Tax Court behind what you do and how you approach valuations in uh, gifting situations. And this is where if you do have succession planning, if there's family in the business, you can really get some mileage out of going through a formal valuation process and getting into discounting down to fair market value, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, even if you're thinking about a transaction, this is a great way to take some money off the table 
preserve it for the next generation before you gross it up for a strategic value. You, you, you can pass it on before that transaction happens. Um, some of the other investment value, that's just strategic value that we talked about. Our firm does a fair bit of ESOP valuation. We have uh, probably 70 recurring ESOP clients. Uh, probably every year we are looking to help advise on um, three to five brand new ESOP transactions. So we create a fairness opinion that the value is not more than um, appropriate adequate consideration. That's one of the benchmarks uh, that is uh, required by the Department of Labor when valuing ESOP companies. The, uh, I think the next slide helps to understand maybe where uh, a valuation professional would um, help in the planning process uh, for gifting in particular. And if you, the top, the, at the top of the page, you, we start with strategic value. That's ultimately the highest price. You're hopefully going to have five to 10 different companies putting um, letters of intent in front of you that you can then uh, pick and choose the best offer from those. Uh, but someone that's trying to sell to their management team, someone that wants to gift to their um, kids, that's obviously not what they want to um, have the transaction value or likely don't want the transaction value to be. So through what we call minority interest and mar marketability discounts, we get to a much lower value off of a control valuation. And so we're starting with fair market value at control. All of those methods that we talked about earlier will pr produce a control marketable value. And um, that's not what we're giving away if it's a privately held company and it's say a 5% interest in a privately held company. And so we can take significant discounts that um, the IRS and the United States Tax Court is blessed. And on the next page, um, we go through some of, there are many, many studies that help support the discounts we take. As sort of a rule of thumb for those who are advising, um, for lack of control discounts, you could probably be anywhere from 5 to 25%, depending on the facts and circumstances of that interest you're giving. It's a pretty wide range. I think you, you probably typically see them between 10 and 20%. They tend to be a little bit lower than the marketability discounts. The marketability discounts, depending again on the company itself and the facts, uh, can be 10 to 45%. And what an appraiser will look to when judging the overall level of discounts really is that rate of return. So at the end of the day, if we take a 50% discount on a company, and I'm consistently earning dividends at a rate, even if I'm a 5% shareholder, that suggests my rate of return is 60 or 70%. That's probably an asset that's been undervalued. And um, so that's one of the ways we look at the reasonableness of these discounts. Um, and there are many companies that don't provide any level of, of distributions, um, don't have the ability through their weak cash flow to do so, and those are the situations you can really see at the higher end of the range. Um, I'll touch real briefly on the next slide, which is retirement income needs. It goes without saying, if you're planning for the rest of your financial future and you're not going to be employed, you're not going to have the asset that's providing your main source of income, you really should do some retirement planning. And our our suggestion is to get a professional involved if you don't already have one, an investment advisor, insurance advisor, to figure out and stress test your retirement needs. You know, what happens if you have a catastrophic loss of income? Do you still have enough to live off of if you decide to give away half of your estate in succession planning? Then, and once it's, it's gone, it's gone, unless you go begging to your kids or grandkids to get the money back. So you want to make sure that uh, you've done a thorough retirement income analysis prior to implementing any plan, sale to third party or gifting strategy. The last slide is, is probably um, the one that I think uh, highlights where valuation could be most useful to um, whether it be a, an advisor or a business owner thinking about what to do. There are some and this is just, these are just a few strategies that can be employed. 
uh, prior to um, either a sale to a third party or implementing a gift strategy. And as I said previously, gifting to uh, trusts and families, you know, Mario will probably have a, a lot of information on different strategies in, in gifting. Um, and even if you are thinking about selling to a third party, a strategic buyer, there are some unique opportunities to take advantage of to minimize estate taxes um, by setting up gifting well in advance. And the idea here is really start planning in the future because all of this takes time. You're going to have to draw up uh, legal documents, go through an appraisal process. And the further you get from a transaction event, the better for discounts and getting the lowest potential value. If you've already signed up John to sell your company and you have letters of intent, I probably can't get you too high of a discount on lack of marketability. You've already gone to market. Um, something else that we see um, with clients, less and less of them are C corporations, but obviously with uh, the, the threat of taxation in a transaction at the corporate level in a C corporation, and then again at the shareholder level, if the assets are distributed out to shareholders, creates an extra complexity of taxation. We have been advising and have done several transactions of conversions of C corporations to S corporations. When the business owner is thinking about selling, again, yes, you're going to lock in your built-in gain when you do that, but you're going to do it at a fair market value, uh, lower price than, than what you would be doing at um, going to market. So there's still some savings um, as opposed to just taking the entire hit on the gain should um, you know, a wonderful offer come from a strategic buyer. Um, the other thing that we help with and we see more and more as, as folks are looking to transition their businesses are um, creating buy-sell agreements and provisions for valuation and buy-sell agreements. We usually recommend that it have a fair market value um, provision and no, that's not just self-serving. We really do think that is the appropriate way to go. We find that the formula values don't hold up well over time. They can, and maybe that, that, that's um, something that serves the purpose. You just have to be really careful about how you set them up. Uh, the ones that we see that really don't hold up well are the ones that are based on the most recent year of income. And um, when uh, a company, like in 2008, we saw 2008 was a record year for folks, but by December they knew their business was not what it was. And we had lots of people exercising under management agreements um, to buy uh, under a formula value. And then the last item on the list there is, is ESOPs, which um, is basically a sale. You're making your own market. You're setting up a trust that can purchase the shares, and there are certain tax benefits to doing that. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm happy to take questions, but I think the idea is probably to take questions at the end. Um, so unless there's uh, any burning desire, I think I'll hand it over to John here. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Mario. I especially thank Mario because uh, sometimes I'm getting up in the morning to go do these in Toledo, and I, I actually live one exit away from here, so it was nice to, uh, to not have to uh, hold my breath and hoping to get too much snow but only get one exit away. You know, is, uh, you know, we looked at what the, Mario asked me about what my topic was, and, and Jason went over sort of a whole spectrum of uh, valuation uh, metrics. You know, what I'm going to focus on in my presentation is um, looking at, you know, again, specifically if an owner decides uh, of a business that they're ultimately going to transition through a sale. And, you know, walk through some of the uh, concepts and things that we go through uh, as part of that. And, you know, as Mario said, I'm John Rubin with uh, Edgepoint Capital Advisors. We're based in Beechwood, and we've been around since 2000. Uh, Twelve-person uh, merger and acquisition uh, investment banking firm. And we work, um, you know, again, although we're based here, we, we actually work all over the, the country um, working on deals. And, you know, when we look at transition to us, 80% of what we do is representing owners in a sale or transition. And sale to us, if you know, is could be sale to outside third party, sale to management, um, you know, a recapitalization where you might bring in a partner, 
private equity as, as a sale uh, or an ESOP. We do a lot of work in ESOP. So to us, you know, anytime shares are moving hands and money is exchanging hands, you know, we can help facilitate that, uh, uh, that transaction. We also represent buyers. So we think that gives us a unique perspective. Not a lot of folks um, in what we do will represent buyers. And our market is uh, what we call lower middle market companies. Companies generally five to 150 million in revenues. So that's primarily companies that are closely held family businesses. All our backgrounds in the firm are, uh, most of us are recovering CPAs uh, or attorneys. So we've uh, worked in that environment and spent our careers, a number of us have owned businesses uh, or advised closely held businesses in our career. So that's kind of our focus in, in what we do. Um, we generally close about 10 to 15 deals a year. And as like I said, we're working all around the country Actually, several times a year, we'll work with foreign uh, buyers on deals. So we're, we're actually having discussions uh, about value and preparing for exit um, with people all over the place. So we're engaged in many conversations. So we think, again, that gives us a, a good perspective on this, uh, on this process. Right now, we have 20 active engagements. So as you, on the first couple pages, as I just said, the, as, as Jason said, the commercial for us, you'll see some of our... Uh, you know, senior leadership. Uh, one of my partners, uh, Dan Wyman, is, uh, has joined us here today, too. And our, our practice uh, focuses a lot. We, you know, you'll see again on page, uh, I believe it's page four, uh, we work primarily in manufacturing and industrial uh, related companies. But we have a lot of experience in business services, distribution, rail, uh, you'll see a lot of automotive, chemicals. So we have a fairly broad spectrum of, of industries we, we work with, which again, we think gives us a, a good perspective on what buyers and what people in the market are valuing businesses uh, in these general uh, you know, types of companies are uh, these days. I'm gonna flip ahead to, uh, let's see, it's Looks like it's page eight. Um, you know, this is part of a larger presentation we, we typically do, which goes through sort of the preparation. And that's, you know, again, when we talk about the sort of the theme of today was preparing your business um, for exit. We're going to talk on about the sort of the upper part of this slide. Um, and it's, you know, what are some of the uh, objectives that, that owners have? Um, you know, what are some of the things you should think about with regards to a company and getting it prepared? And then what, are, what do we do and what does your team do as, as part of that? And again, we'll, hopefully you won't get the sensation of uh, sipping water from a fire hose in this, although I, th I think that would probably freeze today if you tried that. Um, you know, in our minds, just to, to give it a context, we we're asking three questions. Is the owner ready for this type of, of transition? Is the market ready for this type of transition? And then is the business ready for this type of transition? And when those three uh, aspects intersect, then it's, uh, you know, it's probably an optimal time for an owner to strongly consider um, uh, doing that. So as we go through this, I'm going to highlight some of the, and we look at it, you know, Jason had, you know, some of the mathematical, um, you know, and theoretical things that go into valuation. Uh, I'm going to highlight, we're going to talk about some of the, there's, you know, quantitative parts of that, but there's also qualitative things that go into that decision and, and how we approach that. We have a partner that says the, the soft issues, the huggy issues. Um, on the next page, um, you know, a lot of times for owners, when they get to that point, if they're considering transition, uh, sale is a possible transition, you know, that there's definitely more questions than answers when they, they get started. And as we sit down and talk to people, you know, we try and help them in that, you know, are they ready for this process? Is the owner ready? And you know, some of these questions are, what are they selling? You know, is, is it their core business? Is it part of their, their business? Is there certain divisions or things they do that, that could be sold? Um, do they want to own, if they own their real estate that the, the business is in, do they want to keep that? So those types of things uh, might be swirling around in their mind. Um, you know, why are they selling? And this gets to that qualitative uh, aspect of it. You know, are they looking to retire? Do they need cash uh, out to retire and meet some financial planning goals or, or uh, retirement planning goals? You know, is there, is there industry or is there something external uh, causing them to do that? Is there consolidation 
uh, that might, um, you know, they're wondering about. You know, in, there's quality of life issues. You know, we've had it at times where an owner's perfectly happy running their business, but a spouse gets sick or a child gets sick, and, you know, life circumstances change, and, and they want to consider this. You know, how should they sell? People who don't do this all the time, you know, people, we meet with a lot of owners that are great at, at, at bending metal or, uh, you know, moving their product around, but they've never done this before. So when you start talking about, you know, asset sale, stock sale, you know, contingent payouts, earnouts, um, you know, equity rollovers, it's a, there's a lot of very confusing terminology that goes on around this. And a lot of owners will opt to not deal with it and stick with what they know and what, what they feel comfortable with. So answering that question, that's, that's kind of what we do is, is we help with that. Um, you know, who do I want to sell to? You know, we talk to a lot of owners that have competitors, uh, which would be a strategic buyer uh, that may, they may want to buy uh, or sell the business to. Um, you know, management, they say, you know what, I've, I, I wouldn't have what I have in the value of this business if I didn't have such a good management team. So I really would maybe consider getting some ownership to, uh, to that group. Um, you know, private equity. And you'll hear a lot about that, at least in our world, private equity has been a, a very, um, and I'll spend a little bit more time on that in, in a couple minutes, but you know, do you want to sell to somebody who you know, is just looking for a company to buy and invest in? You know, ESOPs, uh, again, back to that concept of my employees have helped me get to where I'm at today. Uh, do I want to share you know, that uh, ownership with them as part of the uh, transition? As I mentioned, international buyers come into it, which a lot of owners don't always consider. And then the, the next important thing is, you know, when do I sell? When do I want to do this? And that gets to the planning and, you know, some of the planning concepts we'll talk about when it comes to is the business ready um, for this process. On the next page, uh, we talk about, you know, it, what's, you know, is the market ready? And it seems self-serving to say for us, but you know, I've, I've been in this business about 20 years, and, and some of you might have been around longer than that. I, I've never seen a better time than right now to at least be considering this, and, and uh, for the market. I mean, I still think there's been a better time in the last 20 years. Why do we say that? <clears throat> One, we know there's a, a tremendous amount of activity going on. You know, we, we've never been busier, um, you know, since we've been in business and started in 2000. And there's a number of factors for that, but the main, main ones, and this isn't in any, any particular order, but, you know, interest rates right now are, you know, historical lows. You know, they're not going to get any cheaper. And I, I think there's a, a mix of professional advisors and uh, owners in here, so I mean, there's some folks from uh, banking. But banks, it's, it's certainly not the heady days of 06 where, um, you know, cash flow lending was, uh, uh, was like the Wild West and, and businesses were getting financed. But... Uh, banks are back to being more aggressive and, uh, you know, have cash to lend into deals to uh, help get them done. So there's availability of capital through banks. Um, capital gains rates are low. You know, there was a big budget fight a couple years ago, and cap gains rates went up, but didn't go up as much as I think people might have feared they would have, which might have dampened activity. So capital gains rates are still generally at a historical, uh, historical low. Uh, capital availability and supply of money. When you look at who potential buyers could be, you know, a lot of publicly traded companies have, uh, have stockpiled cash um, through the recession. So strategic buyers have a lot of cash on their balance sheet, which is dry powder for them. Uh, you know, the economy hasn't been, you know, growing by gangbusters. So there's a lot of businesses that, that have to grow. If they can't grow organically, they're going to look to grow through acquisition. So there's, a, there's an active buyer pool created by, uh, by those companies that have that type of cash. A couple other points here. We, we talk about a, a third factor is there's a large private equity overhang. And this goes back to that supply of money. And this, I think, is a, a unique um, factor in today's market is that, you know, private equity could represent anything from, from two, you know, individuals throwing money in a hat to say, let's go buy companies, grow them sell them uh, for more than what we paid uh, as an investment up to, you know, large uh, endowments and pension funds and, you know, professionally managed, publicly traded private equities. But, you know, across that whole spectrum, you know, their idea is that they will uh, buy companies, grow them, and sell them for a, uh, a return. And, and because there's less, you know, 
ability to, to grow that in the, the public markets, there's a lot of that money is looking at lower middle market companies, smaller companies that wouldn't have been on their radar a number of years ago. So they're not getting the returns they wanted um, from larger companies before. So they're looking now at a lot closely held companies to do that. And there's a certain cycle to how this private equity has raised money over the years. They generally would raise money for a period of time, <clears throat> buy companies, hold them, grow them, sell them, raise more money, and do it again. Well, the recession threw a wrench into that cycle. You know, there was a lot of money raised, but there wasn't a lot of businesses worth buying during that period. So money stockpiled in these groups, and um, you know, so there's a, sort of a lot of pent-up demand uh, in these groups for businesses. And then fundraising through additional groups has grown uh, significantly over the, the last several years. So, you know, bottom line is there's just huge pools of money out there looking to buy companies. So that's another, you know, factor that's, uh, you know, uh, contributing to a, a very active market. And then companies just in general there's, are, are doing better. Um, you know, again, not gangbusters, but there's a lot of owners now that, you know, look at if they were 62 when the recession started, and they've had to, had to kind of dig out of that hole for the last five years. They've kind of gotten back to where they were, and now they're 67. They're saying, you know what, I'm not going to miss this cycle. I really want to uh, uh, consider a transition now. Uh, I don't want to, you know, see what's going to happen. You know, uh, no one knows what's going to happen a year or two years from now. So there's a number of factors that could affect that. So they're looking to possibly get out and, uh, you know, consider an exit today. And then industry consolidation, there's some other ancillary things. So from, it, you know, from our standpoint, when we ask, is the market ready, uh, we think that's today is a resounding yes. And there's a couple slides supporting you know, some of the statistics uh, you know, behind that uh, you know, assessment on our part. Mm -hmm. When you move over to page 14, you're know, kind of moving back to the owners and really wanted to give you a snapshot as to, um, you know, again, we have hundreds of conversations with owners, but you know, there's some common themes. Families are different, businesses are different, and you know, ownerships are different. But you know, it seems the priorities and the, the concepts around what their priorities are seem to uh, repeat themselves. You know, a pattern develops. So a lot of business owners, you know, seem to fall within, um, you know, the way this pattern is. Their their goal or objective, if they decide to go down this, this sale process is, you know, do they want highest price or they would like a highest price uh, for their business. Some care about preserving their legacy. You know, the, the company is, is very important to them or family if it's multi-generational, might be important to a, a community. Um, another one is, in, you know, they want it to be employee friendly. A lot of people, and we deal with folks in, in some smaller communities, they're worried that, you know, if I sell, I don't want this business moved. You know, there's 250 families that rely on, um, you know, a paycheck. I, I don't want to consider that. So, you know, I want my employees taken care of in, you know, whatever happens on the other side of a transaction. And then the, another concept there is confidentiality. Again, uh, entrepreneurs are typically very, uh, very private with their business. And, um, you know, they worry about, you know, keeping things confidential and, and um, you know, not having everybody know their, their business. And so it could be one of those objectives. Generally, it's some, you know, uh, uh, crossover between one or two of these. On the next page, you know, based on uh, more often than not, highest price ends up being part of that, uh, part of that discussion. And, you know, here just in, again, from a snapshot based on numerous discussions we have, um, here's some of the things we see today when we talk to buyers that are most important to, and again, I go strategic buyers or people in an industry, that, uh, the same industry as our, our client seller might be, uh, or financial buyers, which are those private equity groups that are looking to invest and grow businesses. And you know, some of the more important aspects in preparation in deciding whether um, you know, the business, or the things that affect value when we talk about that, and then we'll talk about how you prepare to meet these, these things are, you know, is there a strong opportunity to grow sales in the company? So private equity and, and other buyers, they want to buy growth. They want to see uh, expansion over time. So that, that's always important, um, you know, in those discussions. Is there recurring revenue? You know, is it a business that, that will have the ability to, you know, continue producing consistent revenue over time? 
is management capable? Is there a strong management team behind the owner, or is the owner still the main person uh, running the business so that um, you know customers call them all the time? They're the you know they're out on the floor, they're answering the phone. You know they spread out their management team to help help run the business. You know is there any proprietary or patented technology in the business that would make it difficult for a competitor or somebody to um, compete with them? Uh, are they in a defensible niche or segment? You know, do they, have, do they possess something unique that, um, you know, a process or a relationship that would be difficult for somebody to replicate? You know, do they have long-term contracts, which in a lot of instances seem to be less and less uh, prevalent? Uh, customer concentration. You know, if, if you have a great business, a very profitable business, but, you know, 90% of it resides with one customer, uh, that's a risk point for a buyer. That'll affect how they view value because, you know, as we saw in the recession, you know, even long-term relationships disappeared. So uh, customer diversification is, is also an important factor to buyers. You know, are there acquisition opportunities? As I mentioned, the you know, organic growth has been uh, stunted, at least in the mo more recent times. So are there opportunities to acquire additional businesses uh, by that buyer? <clears throat> and then for us, value, you know, to get highest price, uh, you know, Going through a, a competitive process, you know, helps drive up value um, for the owners under these circumstances. So I've talked about, you know, things to assess that we assess when we look at whether is the owner ready to do this. You know, we've talked about, you know, is the market ready, and we think it is. So you know the. Remaining slides, I want to talk about some things that, that we often advise our clients on. And, and there's a lot of clients we work with that uh, you know, we start talking to them several years before they actually um, get decide to pull the trigger and, and go through a formal marketing process to sell the company. So these, these are the things we'll talk to someone about if they say, well, I'm not quite sure what the, the value is. I'm not sure when I want to do this. We'll start looking at some of these you know, business concepts to see whether the business is prepared so that when they do want to make that decision and move ahead, that the business is in the best position to uh, achieve those value drivers you know, that we talked about in the previous slide. So this is how do I get, that com how do I get the company ready to sale, for sale. And the five concepts we have here, and th there's others, but you know, we look at the, you know, the emotional considerations, there's operational, financial, legal, and tax, uh, and sales and marketing. You know, the first is the emotional. Again, some of these we, I've already touched upon is, you know, but people often underestimate, we have a lot of owners that often underestimate, you know, the emotional component of, of selling their business. Uh, there, there's a ton of anxiety involved in this process. Um, my partner Dan has a, Dan Wyman has an uh, undergraduate degree in psychology and an MBA in finance, and there's days you question whether you use the psych, your psychology degree more than you, you use your uh, a finance degree with owners because it's an emotional roller coaster uh, for a lot of folks. You know, if you're a second or third generation business owner, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, emotional equity uh, involved in that process. So, you know, we often find though knowledge is power. You know, fear of the unknown is is often a paralyzing uh, aspect for a lot of owners. And what we do is we help coach owners and you know shine light into the darkness. You know, we look around those corners and say. You know, we've done this, you know, li literally hundreds of times. Here's what we've seen other owners do. We kind of hold their hand and through that process, and we're kind of interpreters for a lot of the terminology and things they haven't heard of or experienced in this process before, and we get them through that, uh, through this process. So it's, you know, how do I, again, we talked about employees. When do I tell my employees as part of the process? You know, what's going to happen to my family, the community, and the legacy? So that, that's, we talk about those things. You know, from an operational standpoint, which is the second component there, you know, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, a capable and strong management team is often very important to buyers uh, with regards to value. So as part of that preparation process and planning process, we look at evaluating uh, the leadership team. Are they capable? Who has the relationships in the business? When there's a problem, who, you know, who does the main, uh, who does the, um, Customer call. Do they call the owner, or has the owner started to disperse, you know, multiple contact points in the business so that, you know, suppliers or vendors or customers or people on the floor they're not doing everything, uh, 
you know, Dan and I met with a company recently, <coughs> trucking related, where you know the owner has a couple hundred employees, but he's still crawling under trucks and you know going in the repair shop. And you know, as part of this preparation process, you know, we said you, you've got to pull yourself out of that day-to-day -day stuff and be more strategic. Start finding people you know, on your team so that you know the value doesn't just reside with you. Because a buyer will see big risk if they're writing a big check and the owner goes away and suddenly you know all those contact and all that knowledge leaves. So it's evaluating leadership and those relationships uh, are important. <clears throat> Here's a number of ways to reduce uh, operational costs. Um, well, I guess I'll step back on the, the management team too. You know, some people will, uh, it depends on if they have an advisory board, but finding the right people who are committed you know, some people think, well, my employees will just step up. And then when we find out, we might have conversations with them, and they're just perfectly happy being supervisors, you know, on the floor or in a, a certain area. They don't want ownership. You know, they, they don't want to have to worry about signing personally, uh, guaranteeing debt or loans with the business. So, so, again, having those conversations in preparation helps identify the gaps where there could be gaps in that leadership. And, again, it gives the owner time. Time's their friend and enemy in this process. The sooner you start doing these things, uh, you know, the better position you are in for when you do decide to, to go down this path. So reducing operational costs, you know, we'll talk about, uh, you know, your supplier pricing terms, labor contracts, you know, getting all that stuff looked at, uh, cleaned up uh, beforehand uh, will help the business, you know, be better prepared. Um, you know, on the next page, uh, we talk about, you know, optimizing operational ratios, uh, inventory turns, you know, making sure you got your hands uh, around inventory, um, your, your days, uh, your payables, get your uh, payables uh, lined up, your receivables, so that, you know, working capital in value becomes a important component at some point uh, down the process. So, you know, we want to make sure we, you've got your arms around the working capital so that doesn't negatively impact value. Um, so there's a lot of metrics that people can use to measure the efficiency of the business. And again, we help look at that ahead of time uh, in anticipation of what we think buyers will look at and value there. You know, simple stuff like sell excess uh, uh, inventory. You know, entrepreneurs are generally very resourceful. So we were walking through a metal fab shop recently, tons of machines out in the, you know, uh, maintenance yard. And we said, what are you doing with this? And the owner says, well, you know, there's a part on this one I may use one time. So I got this machine at auction. I bought this one, and I'm going to use a little part out of it sometime. So they'll cannibalize stuff, which is great when you're, you're running the business. But someone coming through isn't going to give you value for all this, you know, machinery sitting, sitting around. There's a lot of folks who have inventory. You know, they, they'll set up tooling to make some parts. You know, they may need to only sell five of them now, but since they have it set up, they'll make 100, and 95 sit in inventory. And they expect value from buyers when, when they come through and they said, I can't tell you when I'm going to sell it, but someday I'm going to sell it. So it, it's kind of aligning those types of things for um, uh, getting rid of uh, the excess. Mm -hmm. Getting to the financial uh, aspects and kind of move along here quicker. Um, you know, in helping due diligence, you want to have stronger financials. So value will stand up from a historical standpoint if you have you know, good books and records from a, a historical standpoint. So what we do is we, we help, or we ask, or recommend that people get, you know, it helps establish credibility. So if you only have compiled statements, you know, a lot of owners haven't had to borrow in the past. So they just use QuickBooks or their tax returns. So we recommend they go, you know, see folks uh, like Jason at Apple and get either an audit or a review, uh, reviewed statement. It adds credibility for when someone's looking under the hood uh, as part of that. We also say clean up the balance sheet. So if there's shareholder loans or things that you know are unique or have worked for the business in the past, but to someone else would be unclear, you know, we recommend they they clean that stuff up. You know, I talked about working capital. You know, page 22. You know, we have an overview of M&A deal math, and this is where uh, you know Jason mentioned earlier, cash free, debt free. There's a number of different ways that we value companies, uh, discounted cash flow. Leverage taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Then people talk about multiples. What's the multiple? And, and it's more complicated than that. Um, but 
you know, finding what the, depending on what the buyer's multiple is, that comes up with an enterprise value. From that value, the, the owner um, pays off their any interest-bearing debt. They keep the cash. The proceeds less tax than the net proceeds they keep. It's not what you sell a business for. It's what you keep uh, at the end. Um, multiples are a very dangerous thing in our business. Multiples have been up generally for businesses of all sizes, but uh, we're selling two companies right now with the exact same sales and the exact same EBITDA. We went to a couple hundred buyers for one of them, and the multiple came back at, at between four and four and a half times. The other business it came back between six and six and a half times, and it had to do with you know the one business had greater growth prospects uh, in an industry that had greater future potential than the other one. But the sales and the, the bottom line were the same. So again, that goes back to some of the qualitative things um, in a business that, that affect value. Page 24, we talk about, you know, again, buyers pay for growth. So having strong historical information and then a credible forecast helps create, you know, some uh, uh, comfort from a buyer's perspective, strong likelihood of future growth. Uh, for what they're paying for. You know, the next page, CapEx, you know, do you repair the roof or do you put a new roof on? Do you buy that new machine or not? Because again, that will affect future cash flow for our clients and we got to assess whether you know, you, you're going to do that, uh, those capital expenditures. Sales and marketing, again, another area that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, could, depending on the type of business, could be impactful uh, for value. You know, legal and tax is a, a, the next section. Um, you know, just make sure the books and records, and Mario can speak to this better, but just make sure the books and records, you know, the right shareholders are identified. You know, we occasionally come across, you know, there's no buy-sell agreements in a business. You know, Grandpa gave his secretary a couple shares 50 years ago, and there's, you know, there has to be a unanimous vote to sell the company. So you got to go find, you know, this family member, and they think they're sitting on a gold mine. So I mean, just, just you've seen a lot more of this too, and you know, so just making sure the books and records are clear. You know who the shareholders are, uh, things like that. You know, uh, Jason also mentioned when you talk about tax structure. Um, you know, S corp, C corp. We, we've helped folks save a lot of money just by working with their advisors on uh, converting, you know, to S corp. Uh, or LLCs, a lot of uh, implications around that. Um, stock sale, asset sale, again, we, we work with the advisors to uh, figure out how that's going to work. <clears throat> you know, for multi-state businesses, you know, make sure all the filings for sales tax and things like that are done. Uh, again, all these things come up on, these are all issues we've seen with due diligence with buyers. When they see risk, they penalize sellers for value. I guess just the, the last point I'll make is on page, uh, let's see, my glasses on here, it looks like 30, it's the uh, pre-sale preparation um, and how this EBITDA adjustment could, could affect, you know, so when you do these ad backs on, on EBITDA, you know, there's a multiplier effect. So when you do some of these things we talked about um, to help improve that cash flow or that EBITDA, you know, for, in this, our example here, we, we found $600,000 of of additional ad backs or adjustments that a new buyer wouldn't wouldn't necessarily spend, and at a six times multiple, you know, you're, um, you know, it's a almost a four million dollar difference. So the, these little things add up, I guess, is the the punchline for for that. And I guess lastly, I'll just you know, the last couple pages talk about assembling your team, and you know, we're we're big proponents of you know again. Certainly, we, we want to be involved in that process, but you're talking to your attorney and your accountant ahead of time, and that preparation ahead of time will, will help, you know, that piece of the pie where, again, is the owner ready, is the market ready, and this will help with the businesses ready. But your financial advisor, you know, making sure you understand how selling a company is going to help your uh, retirement plan, um, you know, it all fits together. And again, we see the best outcomes when, when folks work um, with the team. and and to talk, talk to someone earlier rather than later. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's real important, particularly the last point John made about team approach. Everyone has different disciplines. Um, you, the valuation becomes important because that, because that be, 
sets expectations in the event of a sale as to what can be expected. Um, also for retirement planning, um, how much can the cash or how much can the company distribute out over time and, and gift planning as well. You need to have an appraisal because that's what the IRS typically requires if you're going to be doing some gift planning. Um, if you're looking to sell investment bankers such as John and John's firm, you know, they're invaluable because they can, it is an emotional issue for a business owner, and it's a tremendous amount of work, too, to take a company, uh, prepare it for sale, and get it through the sale process. It's not just a matter of finding a company that's willing to buy. It's, you know, bringing those two together, brokering the deal, and getting, and, and, and working through all the issues that come up in an M&A transaction. So that's a, a critical discipline. Uh, for lawyers, you know, we see clients at all stages of uh, development. So, you know, we have uh, startup companies, we have companies that are in growth stages, and we have company family-owned businesses that where the owner or the founder has gotten to the point where they're considering, you know, what's the next step. Maybe they're approaching retirement age. Um, you know, so th there's decisions to be made, and starting early is critical because there's a lot of planning that needs to be in place. Um, John touched on a number of issues in terms of cleaning the books and records of the company up, trying to tackle financial issues, management issues. Uh, what you do want to do with succession planning is really ask the question, how can this business run without the owner being involved in the day-to-day -day operations? Um, and that's important for um, a number of reasons. Uh, First off is what happens if the owner had an unexpected death or disability so they can't work in the business anymore? I mean, what's going to happen the next day? So that's a conversation that we have with our clients. And, you know, how do you, how do you plan for that sort of thing? Um, you know, we don't want the company to have a tremendous loss in value because it can't do sales anymore. So if you had an owner that was the main salesperson, who's going to take over the sales responsibility? Um, if you had an owner that was basically the chief operating officer who's going to take over the operations the next day. So you need to begin to get that into that dialogue and think about who's going to play those roles. Within the company, are there individuals that can serve those roles? Um, or do you need to look outside the company? So it's a human resources issue, um, but it's something that needs to be uh, discussed. Um, so, that, so that's the death and disability um, piece of this. And, what we would recommend there is that you put together a, you know, you think through what's going to happen, you know, the first week, the first month, the first six months in the event of a sudden death or disability and kind of map out who's going to play what role. Um, should, another aspect of that is should you have a board of advisors or some kind of board of directors that can really help oversee that process? And I think it's important. Uh, to have a board, at least a board of advisors, meet quarterly with a business owner so that they understand the business and they can help advise the owner as to how to tackle uh, long term planning. And, you know, there might be issues with, uh, you know, staffing issues, having the right people in the right place. But if, if you get the right kind of counseling, you know, maybe it's, you know, people that have, are retired or currently in business that have a lot of business experience. And they could really serve as a valuable sounding board in terms of helping the owner uh, figure out issues. But if the, that, that board also serves as a nice transition vehicle for a new person that has to step in because that board's going to have a wealth of information about these strategic level decisions and how to transition uh, the new uh, CEO, let's say, of the company in the event someone has to step in. Uh, I'm on the actually slide two of my presentation. Uh, succession planning, really what is it? There's business goals, family goals, and long range strategic planning, all with the idea of how to preserve the business and maximize the business value. Uh, the business goals are, are basically, you know, how do, how do we make sure that there's going to be enough cash to run the business, um, and how do we make sure that we have the right management team in place? I think from the family goal side is if the, if the owner, you know, putting aside for a minute the sale of the company, uh, which I think is a separate discussion, uh, but if the owner is thinking about retiring and keeping the business, you know, maybe they're going to have family members, 
son or daughter run the business. Uh, maybe there's key employees that can step right into those roles. The uh, owner, when they, he, he or she makes that decision, needs to think about what are the retirement planning needs. So that's where you might get a financial advisor involved. But there's some tension there between uh, the ne cash needs of the business and also the cash needs of the retiring owner. So, you know, what do those cash distributions look like? Are they uh, deferred compensation? Um, or do you consider uh, a sale of the business to a key employee or a family member? And maybe those distributions look like purchase price. Uh, but so there, there's that analysis that has to be done as to what can the uh, company bear to distribute uh, during retirement. And if it looks like there is too much tension there, meaning that the company can't distribute enough to fund the, um, the retirement, then you're probably looking at a sale. Uh, next uh, slide, operations and long-term plan planning. Uh, you know, again, thinking about how do we replace um, the owner if the owner is involved in the business, heavily involved, which is typically the case with the founder. Um, you know, there could be lines of credit that are involved where there's personal guarantees. Uh, the the owner could have very strong customer and vendor relationships be heavily involved in sales. Um, certainly they're probably involved in strategic planning for the business. So identifying individuals to play those roles is critical. Um, again, you know, thinking about what happens if someone had to step in immediately, there's the whole issue about, you know, six months from now the, the market may have changed or, you know, in terms of product sales, competition has changed, the industry changed. You need to have someone thinking in, in terms of strategic planning to be able to tackle those issues and to figure out the way forward with the company. So it becomes important that, you know, today, if you have an owner that's thinking about retirement in the not too distant future, maybe five or 10 years out, um, who are they grooming to play that role? And what kind of management team are they building in order to take the company to the next level? Because uh, John had touched on this already, even if they're even if they're not going to sell the business, or if they're if they're not going to live off the business during the retirement, but they're planning a sale, strategic buyers, private equity buyers, they don't necessarily want to see a business where the owner is so involved that it it can't run by itself. So having a management team in place that's uh, competent and very good becomes a you know a, a val a, definitely a value add to the business. Uh, slide four is, you know, the owner and family requirements. Touched on retirement needs of owner and spouse. Um, you know, other family members, employment. Are, do we have family members that are involved in the business? If we do, um, employment is probably an important part of the family um, dynamic because this business was created by uh, the parents and now one or more of the kids are working there maybe they're an officer maybe they're running the business so that becomes an important consideration when planning the way forward uh, what about non-participating family members maybe we have one or two siblings that are not participating in the business you know what are their concerns or considerations you know they may be looking at this from an inheritance standpoint or perhaps they already own some equity and they're getting distributions uh, so when we're thinking about how to plan this forward, there's a number of dynamics that come into place. And you can kind of see that this gets a little bit into estate planning. You know, similar considerations um, play out here as they do in estate planning in terms of how are we taking care of the family. It's a lot more complicated when you have the family business, however, because there's really more individuals involved in the outcome. Uh, in terms of estate planning for an owner of a business, uh, we need to provide for the, the ownership of the business in the estate plan. So what we typically do or recommend if there's a first marriage, um, in the event of the death of the owner, we would recommend that the estate plan be structured so that it goes to the surviving spouse. Um, in second marriages, that's probably not the case, but it, you know, again, it's, it's what the owner wants. 
but in second marriages, we, it probably makes sense to have the ownership um, or, and the control of the business go in favor of the kids from the first marriage and then make separate provision for the surviving spouse. Um, but that's a discussion that we have um, as part of the estate plan for the owner. <clears throat> okay, in terms of um, operational issues, this is the next slide, five. Um, we think it's important as part of the, again, the succession plan. So when I say succession plan, there's a number of these issues we're running through, but it helps to actually reduce some of these ideas into writing and make procedures. So one of those is that if you have family members involved in the business, it may help to define roles and expectations for those family members because what you don't want to have is conflicts that could arise, whether it's sibling rivalry or disagreements with dividend policies or, or whatever, strategic decisions. So having um, those roles defined, I think, is a way to you know, minimize to the extent you can potential disputes among the family. Again, it's a family, so people are going to, you know, siblings are going to disagree, but um, you want to run it like a business, too. It's not, a business has to run, you know, logically, rationally. You have to make decisions based on good business sense. Family decisions don't always get made that way, as we all know. It's, they're more emotional. Um, so the, the two don't really mesh all, sometimes all that well, um, but in terms of when family members are in the business, they need to be thinking from a business standpoint. So defining those roles and expectations, I think, is important. I mean, and of course, it's going to be fluid because roles are going to change over time. But, and so you need to think about how, what kind of procedures would make sense to evolve with that process. Um, I mentioned establishing a board already. Um, you know, as far as key employees go, they're going to be really the backbone of the operation, right? I mean, a successful business always has key employees. So, you know, what's the issue from the owner standpoint is you want to make sure you keep them, right? Particularly if the owner's going to retire and retain the business during his retirement, um, you need to have those key employees there because they're going to be invaluable to make sure the business runs the way it's supposed to. So that's part of building your management team. So we talk about that with our clients as well in trying to figure out how to, to structure a, a compensation arrangement for key employees that's going to retain them and properly reward them. That may look like, you know, certainly it's going to look like a, there's going to be an employment agreement. Uh, there's going to be non-competition, non-solicitation provisions in there because we don't want our trade secrets to go out the window if the employee decides to leave. So we're going to put contractual restrictions in that way. Um, there may be a bonus plan that makes sense. You know, we, we have to figure out for the key employees what's the best motivator for them, and it might be cash at the end of the day. So if you put performance uh, goals in place that, you know, maybe it's based on revenue growth or profitability, and the key employees share in the uptick with, uh, you know, hitting those metrics, uh, it maybe look like some kind of stock option plan or equity incentive plan where they're actually participating in owners. It could be phantom stock. Uh, but the idea is that you want to align their interests with the owner's interest so that they would get participate in the uh, success of the business. And also, the, you know, you need to have the golden handcuff provision, which is you want to make sure some of this reward is deferred and uh, doesn't vest until they reach retirement age. So that's another piece because we want to make sure they stay there. Um, there's a little bit of a balancing act there um, in terms of what the vesting schedule is going to be and, and what's going to be a good motivator for the key employees. Okay, uh, for the owner's retirement, uh, you know, oftentimes, as John talked about, sale makes the most sense, right? Because you can <laughs> exit in a very up market. It's the, it's the best of times right now to sell. Um, and you know, if there is a market for the business and there's a buyer that out there to be uh, found, then it probably makes sense to, to pursue a sales strategy because sales typically are, if you can get the price, are the least risky uh, to the owner because they take a lot of cash off the table at closing, right? The bulk of the purchase price usually is paid at closing and the balance is paid over 
time. Maybe it's a you know three, five, ten year note, whatever the case might be. Um, but they're taking most of it off the table. If they're retiring, then they still have all their eggs in the basket, right? They're, they're, the business is still there, and uh, there could be a downturn. So their retirement funding could be in jeopardy. If they do a sale to family members or key employees, there's a similar risk, right? Because their family members and key employees don't have a bunch of cash to give them on a sale. So it's going to get paid out over time. It's going to be funded by the business. Um, not that that's a bad idea, I mean, because that might be a good way to go, but, you know, making sure you have that whole management structure in place and you have some, uh, a visionary CEO, someone that's been groomed, uh, and someone that can carry the business through the next decade or so or, and beyond, that becomes very important for the financial security of the owner if they're going to do that kind of a transaction. Okay. The next slide is slide seven. Um, kind of just touched on this already, so we can skip that one. Okay, slide eight, <coughs> uh, the written succession plan. Again, um, you know, the, I've outlined here, these, there's five bullet points. These are five items that we like to reduce to writing in one fashion or another because it makes sense to. Um, so, the written procedures in the event of unexpected death or disability. Again, that's just laying out so everyone knows, here's what's to happen if the owner gets hit by a bus, right? Here, this person's taking over sales, this person's gonna be the CEO. Maybe that's integrated with the board of advisors, so the board of advisors take an immediately larger role to help in a transition. Maybe there's a search that takes place to locate a replacement CEO. Whatever the case might be, whatever makes sense for that business, the, we recommend that that all be laid out in a process. Uh, because what happens there in the event of anyone's untimely death or you know, disability uh, that renders them un unable to perform any further, um, it's an emotional event for the family. So the family might not be in a very good decision-making position at that point emotionally. So to have that all laid out, I think, is very helpful and, and specifically to give assignments and tasks and responsibilities to designated individuals, family members or not. They could just be key employees or advisors, I think um, is important and very helpful. Uh, again, I mentioned employment agreements, non-competes, bonus plans, that for key, key employees. Um, if there's more than one owner, uh, what do you need to have? You need to have a buy-sell agreement, right? Um, because usually um, co-owners or um, owners of um, shareholders of a business don't want to be in partnership with the family members of the other owner, right? So if something happens like a death, a disability, some triggering event, um, that normally or it should kick in options or mandatory requirements to purchase the deceased or uh, disabled shareholder out. So the terms of that need to be spelled out. Um, and I'll actually have a slide coming on, up on that. I'll talk in a little more detail. Um, if there's going to need to be a successor, whether it's the CEO or chief operating officer or head of sales, uh, there should be some kind of plan in place to locate that person. Again, this is if there's an unexpected death or disability, and, it, and we haven't already undertaken that process. Um, and I mentioned already the, the defining the roles for family members. Uh, the next slide, number nine, uh, the buy-sell agreement. I mean, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with these. Uh, the, the, the key provisions here are that upon a triggering event, death, disability, retirement, um, perhaps bankruptcy, uh, there is a buyout in favor of the um, non-terminating shareholder or non-deceased. Um, you know, usually that's based on appraised fair market value. So that's where an appraisal comes into place. It doesn't have to be. It could be something less, on that, less than that as long as it's based on what third parties normally would agree to in those types of agreements. So you generally can't get too far from that. Um, transfer restrictions, we want to make sure shareholders aren't transferring to third parties or family members or whoever else.
and, and financing the purchase. I mean, if you have, if uh, upon death, if we have insurable shareholders, then we could have life insurance to help fund a buyout. But if it's retirement or disability, then we have to think about funding the retirement some other way. And it usually looks like a note that's four or five years, sometimes longer to buy out the disabled or retiring shareholder. Oh, and finally, the last slide I have is a state and gift tax planning. So when we have clients that, with businesses that have substantial value, you know, um, something in the excess of $10 million, there we get into the discussions about what kind of estate and gift tax planning do you want to do with the idea that we can take advantage of the lifetime exemption amount, which is currently $5,340,000 per person. For a married couple, it's double that, $10,680,000. The idea is that we can make gifts up to that amount without having to pay any gift tax and there, or state tax. And there's really two drivers or levers that we try to invoke when doing gift tax planning. One is the valuation discounts that Jason talked about. So that might look like using a family limited partnership or some other mechanism to um, get a valuation discount so we can actually make gifts at less than what they really are worth so to speak, uh, not that there's anything inappropriate with a valuation <laughs> discount, uh, but it's a way to, to leverage um, the, value, the, the valuation principles that are allowed. And the other is to do what's, what are called GRATs, grant or retained annuity trusts, or um, intentionally defective grant or trusts, which um, allow us to make gifts, um, really net gifts, because um, there's payments that are required to be made back to the grantor. And then uh, you know, the discount plus all the future appreciation is really what's being levered so that um, as the business grows, we're, sh we're moving a lot of that appreciation out of the owner's future taxable estate and uh, hopefully putting them in a, a better estate tax position. Um, okay, I think that's enough because we're really close to 930. Well, appreciate everyone coming. Hope you uh, enjoyed it. And have a great day. Stay warm.